So welcome to the uh, chapter on money markets. So first of all, we have to define what the money market is. Um, it's essentially the part of the financial markets that deals with financial instruments that don't pay a coupon. In other words, they don't pay interest uh, in a uh, interest payment form. The way in which the money markets work is that uh, essentially you buy um, something, uh, a financial instrument, and then at the end of the period when it matures, you get paid back a higher amount. The difference in the prices, the price that you pay and the price that you get uh, when you sell it back or when the thing matures would be the rate of interest. So it's an implicit rate of interest um, that you're earning here. Now the money market is short term in nature as well so it's contrasted with the bond market which is obviously longer term and you get the coupon payments there. So the money market you don't get coupon payments and it's relatively short term. So these are so-called, I, I said they're fin financial instruments, the other way to look at them is in terms of what's known as a debt instrument. So they're short term debt instruments that have a high level of liquidity and low default risk. And uh, that's typically what's uh, traded in the money market. Now, why do they have high levels of liquidity? Well, simply because as every bond heads into its last year and then its last six months before it matures, essentially um, it becomes a, a treasury bond if it's a government bond or it becomes commercial paper if it's a corporate bond. Many of the uh, transactions in the money market are done in what's known as a wholesale market. Um, that means that the transactions that take place a large in volume so it's often corporates uh, corporate entities that are doing some of the transactions in the money market um, or central banks uh, short-term debt instruments refers to the fact that this is a market for promises to repay with interest and that the repayment will take place very quickly so Oftentimes, um, we're looking at just three month T bills, for example, or one month T bills, even. And in some cases, um, the dead instruments have an even shorter period to maturity, as you'll see in a second. So, these money market instruments have a high level of liquidity, or should have a high level of liquidity. Now, I've supplied some articles at the end of this PowerPoint uh, that study the two occasions when the money markets kind of dried up and they weren't liquid at all. This is seen as a, an exceptional circumstances or circumstances are exceptional that led to these uh, to this happening um, to the money market drying up. So um, I, I think you should take them as exceptions, interesting exceptions and uh, but exceptions rather than the rule. Um, even though one of them occurred just less this last year. Um, so there's also the fact that these IOUs have a low level of default risk. These are not generally thought of as risky uh, investments, uh, risky assets that are being traded. So why are there money markets? Well, once again, we just use the economics that we've done in this course, and we say that really it's a question of bringing buyers, those who are demanding the assets, and sellers who are supplying the assets. And the demanders for these assets, of course, are people with resources, uh, and uh, you can think of that as excess cash, if you like, and they want a place to park those funds for the short term. Um, you get institutional investors in particular, they're the biggest um, operators in this space, they park, want to park their funds temporarily by purchasing these money market instruments. Um, and um, they, some of the uh, um, buyers in the money markets actually 
buy these, so you can see investment banks, brokers and dealers, buy these to resell them uh, to their customers. And obviously, demanders are going to earn a higher yield than what they would have earned keeping funds in the bank. Now, keeping funds in the bank these days does not earn you a lot at all. In fact, my bank, which pays more than most banks pay, I think pays me something like 0.1%. Um, now, you can get up to 4%. I have in another bank account, but only on a limited amount in that account. But, you know, certainly money markets usually give you greater than 0.1%. Now, recently though, money markets themselves, the yield in, uh, on these short-term treasury bills in many countries has gone uh, to almost zero, if not negative. People still want to hold them, though, because of the safety of them as well. So don't forget, it's not just a question of getting a return. It's also the perception of safety that uh, US T-bills in particular have around the world. So who participates in the money market on the supply side? Well, as I said already, the T-bills uh, are one of the major assets that is traded in the, in, the, in, the, in the money market, and that's those are issued by the US government. Of course, every major country with reasonably well-developed financial markets are going to have a short-term debt market um, like this. So it's not just the US that has the T-bill market, they have a short-term debt market in the UK, in Germany, in Italy, in Japan, I mean pretty much every country does. And oftentimes they're going to call it different things, uh, depending on what the short-term debts are that are traded by the governments concerned. Uh, commercial banks also issue repurchase agreements and bankers acceptances. There are other forms of money market instruments. And um, obviously large corporations, I missed that bullet point, sorry, uh, also issue uh, the equivalent of a T-bill, but it's called some commercial paper. And uh, oftentimes they do this to finance just short-term capital needs. So a T-bill in detail. A treasury bill is a promise to repay with interest uh, and therefore it's highly liquid and has low levels of default risk. So for example, if the, the way this works is if the uh, uh, maturity date, on the maturity date, the value of the bond that's now a T-bill is a million dollars then if you're buying in the T-bill market, you'll buy for less than a million dollars because you obviously want to earn some interest. So the interest that you earn is essentially the difference between what you buy it for, say you buy it for $999,000, um, then you're going to earn the interest of $1,000 uh, and on the million you're going to get a million at the end. So that's basically how it works. Um, why does the government issue these treasury bills? Well, it issues treasury bills uh, because uh, the government spends more money than it has coming in. Um, and uh, so these T-bills are issued because the government borrows the difference uh, causing this budget deficit effect. Um, so here the, the government sells T-bills into the money market to fund its budget deficit. So the money market in terms of T-bills and the bond market is intimately related to uh, the fiscal position of the government. And that goes for any government. So how does the government actually do it? Well, what it does is every week it carries on a Dutch auction. And uh, the Dutch auction auctions these T-bills to raise funds for the federal government. Now, most of the bids that are auctioned, uh, that come in for the auction, 
are from major players, from investment banks, um, etc. And the type of date that we're looking at for these T-bills, it could be 28 days, 91 days, even 182 days. It doesn't usually, it's very rare to find T-bills beyond that, uh, uh, issued anyway, beyond that, that uh, level of uh, maturity date. Um, but uh, obviously there are T-bills with, say, 9-month, 10-month, 11-month, 12-month to maturity. Uh, why? Because some of these older bonds uh, effectively become T-bills as they head towards their maturity date. Uh, these, um, by the way, T-bills have a minimum denomination of a million bucks. And they can be bought over the internet directly from the government um, or indirectly from brokers and through mutual funds. So in 2015, they had 1.4 trillion in T-bills outstanding. It's significantly higher than that now. Um, I would reckon it's probably around uh, uh, three and a half trillion, somewhere around there, three, three and a half. Uh, if you want to look at the rates of issuance, in other words, the, the T-bills that are bought to auction uh, every month, you can see that uh, by clicking the link there to go to the uh, Society of uh, uh, Financial Management um, uh, something or other. Uh, but they basically are the uh, society for, for those who trade in T-bills. Uh, these T-bills are issued at a price below their face value, and once they reach maturity, the government pays the whole of the face value. And these T-bills, um, auctions are done by these competitive bids, bank ranked, uh, you rank for the bids from the highest to the lowest price offered, and you accept the highest bid first, and then you go down uh, through the through the bids until you get to the one that's, uh, uh, that's the final bid to be filled for the paper that you have to to sell. Call it paper. Of course, it's not really paper. It's all done electronically, but it used to be pieces of paper still that were, were traded. And in some countries, those pieces of paper are still traded. Um, no one bidder is allowed to purchase more than 35% of any one issue. And those T-bills are an important part of the money market, not, not the only money market instrument though. So we're gonna look at some of the others now. The federal funds market is in fact part of the money market. Uh, the federal funds market, if you'll recall, is where banks buy and sell uh, money loan and borrow money in order to fulfill their obligations in terms of minimum uh, minimum uh, um, reserves so the minimum reserve requirement so banks may be able to obtain higher interest rates by temporarily lending the reserves to other banks in the federal funds market the fed funds market the interest on such loans of course is the fed funds rate the Fed funds targets these federal funds rates uh, by manipulating the supply of reserves that's offered uh, within the Fed funds market. Next um, is commercial paper. Um, commercial paper is essentially short term uh, debt, uh, unsecured. In other words, there's nothing against that debt that one can claim, issued most often by well established corporations. Why? Because if the company goes bankrupt, by the way, um, then basically uh, you have to stand in line to get some money from for your bonds. Um, there's no guarantee you'll get any money back. The companies um, often do this, uh, you know, raise money. Um, and usually, typically, the length of the maturity is around uh, is less than 270 days long. Usually, it's around three months to six months. Uh, you can have one month T bills as well and one month commercial paper. Um, it's not too common, but you do find it too. Um, it's issued by uh, 
corporations who need to raise funds for a short period of time and the companies may be required to issue commercial paper to help pay their payroll during really slow periods. So if the demand for the products in the firm is seasonal, then the firm may decide to issue some commercial paper to cover that period of time. The next type of short-term debt instrument is the repo otherwise known as the repurchase agreement. So this is a financial arrangement whereby one party sells an asset, usually a T-bill, with the agreement to buy the asset back or repurchase it uh, at a specific date in the future at a higher price. So it's the higher price that gives you the rate of return, gives you the interest, essentially. So in other words, you loan it out and you you basically uh, uh, agree to repurchase it at a higher price. So you loan out the money, uh, sorry, the, the asset notice, it's um, a T-bill, and you get money for that. But you're gonna have to pay for the money. So in other words, when you buy, pay for borrowing the money, so when you buy the T-bill back, you're gonna buy it back at a higher price to pay the interest, essentially. These are usually very short term, they're overnight usually to just a, two, a few days. I have seen seven day repos, but they are rare. And uh, securities firms in particular use these repos on a daily basis. And uh, of course you can get reverse repos as well. And a reverse repo is where one party buys an asset uh, with an agreement to sell the asset back. Um, so when they're buying the asset, of course, they're lending uh, money out um, and then they repurchase the asset back uh, at essentially a, a, uh, a sell it back, sorry, at a higher price. So that's the way they earn the interest on that asset. In other words, providing the money based on the asset kind of as collateral. That's one way of looking at it. Next are these negotiable certificates of deposits or negotiable CDs. Um, these are sometimes referred to as jumbo CDs. Um, you must have at least $100,000 um, to put into uh, one of these jumbo CDs. And it was first invented by, in 1961 by National City Bank, which is now part of Citigroup. These are traded amongst the banks. So for instance, uh, if you open a, a jumbo CD with a bank, often the bank will say, okay, well, we know we've got to pay the interest on this. Let's just, but we need to cover other expenses as well. So let's just sell this asset on for the moment and then we can uh, uh, fund our other activities and just buy the asset back later on. And uh, you know, that's one way of, of, of using uh, jumbo CDs and managing your balance sheet at the same time. Next, we have banker's acceptances. Uh, these, this is a relatively small amount in the money market. Um, what are banker's acceptances? They're a common way to facilitate trade, international trade. Um, it's a promise by one party to pay another party in the future, which is accepted or guaranteed by a bank. So in other words, if you're importing something and um, basically you don't have the funds because uh, uh, you haven't managed to sell the product yet because you don't have the product um, then you might want to get a banker's acceptance to do this so in other words um, essentially uh, you get the banker's acceptance uh, letter which says the bank will back your trade with this company with this foreign company and pay you know help you pay what's owed now the banker's acceptance letter then is a traded instrument uh, basically so that uh, the uh, 
company that um, is doing the international trade, that the importing, for, for example, basically is getting a loan uh, based on that banker's acceptance until they can get hold of the goods which have been imported and then sell them into the market and get the money back. So when, is, when a banker's acceptance is used, well often in international trade as we know, but when two parties don't know each other too well. Um, it's a common way to facilitate trade. So it's a form of, if you like, a letter of credit is really what it is. Euro dollar accounts. Well, this is an interesting one because you usually don't think of bank accounts as being traded, but in this case they are. So this is a euro dollar account, uh, which is, you're probably thinking a dollar that's issued in Europe. Well, you'd be wrong there because it's not. Um, it's a bank account that's denominated in a currency other than the currency of the country in which the depository institution resides. Now, London might be the most obvious place. So if you have a US dollar account in London, then it's a euro dollar account. Now, if you have a yen account in Canada, interestingly, that's also called a euro dollar account. You're probably thinking that the dollar doesn't have anything to do with that. Uh, you'd be right, but this is the convention. So as long as you can see the definition at the top here, as long as it satisfies that def definition of being a bank account in another currency other than the currency of the country in which the um, bank account is. So here he tells you the name is a misnomer, just really told you that, because they are den dollar denominated deposits outside of the US, but not, ne not necessarily in Europe. And these are typically for a million bucks or more. They're den dominated by government and large corporations. That's really coming to an end. Uh, these chapters on markets are relatively short. Um, there's some uh, interesting group discussion questions um, about uh, money markets, etc. So that's one thing you can look at. And here I've provided some interesting references and articles. Um, so uh, the variety of different sources. So hopefully you'll find those interesting. Okay, well, thank you for listening, and uh, I'll see you next time.